It's good to be back here with all of you, and we are currently in the book of Acts. So turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 3 as we continue our study through this amazing book. Let's open up in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, once again, we count it a privilege and honor to gather together to worship you, uh, to seek your face. Lord, we thank you for your word. It's truly living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, and we pray that you would pierce our hearts, even as you pierce the hearts of all those Jewish people that were listening to Peter and the message he was proclaiming, the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, that we would have ears to hear what your Spirit is saying to us, and we ask, Father, that you would strengthen us for the, uh, for these days in which we live, that we would um, be bold in our witness of you, um, we would be light and salt to those around us. And Father, we ask that in all that we do, you get the glory. Uh, apart from you, we can do nothing, but we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So may you strengthen us this morning and this coming week for the things you have in store for each one of our lives. And we just commit this to you now, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so I'll turn to Acts 3. Uh, the day of Pentecost had come and gone. We saw that in Acts chapter 2. Uh, that's the day that the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the 120 disciples that were gathered in the upper room. We're told the Spirit came as a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind. Uh, there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire over each one of their heads. Now that's in the past. Uh, those tongues of fire are no longer visible. Uh, they're not getting up in the morning, looking in the mirror, see if their little fire is over their heads. It's in the past. Uh, you might say that those divided tongues of fire on the outside have now been replaced with a burning fire in their hearts on the inside. Their hearts are on fire for the Lord. Uh, they have love for Jesus. They're empowered with the, uh, the Holy Spirit. So now all these disciples are instruments in God's hands. Last time, when we were looking at chapter 3, Peter and John were going up to the temple. It was about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. They're going up there to pray. And as they're walking to the temple, they see this man. And, and we'll see later on, he was lame from his mother's womb, unable to walk for 40, over 40 years. And they used to lay him down at the gate beautiful. And he would just beg for alms. And so he sees Peter and John coming towards them. And Peter says, look at us. And so he looks at them, you know, hoping to get a handout, you know, a couple shekels or something. And instead, when Peter reaches out his hand, uh, he doesn't give him a handout, but he says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And immediately, we're told, the man's ankle bones, all the ligaments, I mean, all the deformity in his legs just snap back into place. And he knows he's healed perfectly, instantly. And it says he began to uh, leap and jump, and he's praising the Lord. Uh, again, what joy filled this guy's heart as he is now a new creation in Christ, because we'll see that he not only receives a physical healing, he is spiritually saved. He receives Jesus as his Lord and Savior. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us, but I bet there is a little jump in Peter and John's step as well. I mean, when you're being used by the Lord and you know God is opening up doors and you're going through those doors and He's using you to be a light, to be a, a witness, I mean, that's an amazing thing to realize I'm nothing, but God is using a little instrument like me in His hands. And so this is what they're experiencing. They've seen Jesus heal multitudes of people, raise up many lame people, but now He's working in and through their lives. And they quickly realize they're not the ones healing anybody, but it's the risen, living Lord and Savior Jesus dwelling in them who is doing these amazing things through them. And so God has an awesome way of giving us those opportunities from time to time, but we need to make sure that we are ready. Uh, like we saw in the video, uh, we need to be uh, ready in season and out of season to give an answer for the hope that's in us. And so, you know, you can go through weeks, maybe months in your life, and nothing out of the ordinary is happening, but then all of a sudden, you know, God brings somebody into your life, and you don't even realize it at the moment, but they might be like a coworker or neighbor, and 
They can tell you, hey, I know you're a Christian. Our family's going through a lot. Do you think you could pray for us? And it's like, uh, yeah. And, and so God opens up a door, and you can just share whatever the Lord puts on your heart at that moment to minister to them. And so afterwards, you just think, yes, thank you, Lord, for using a, a simple person like me. And it feels great to be an instrument in God's hands. That's one of the lessons we see here in chapter 3. Again, Jesus using ordinary people to do extraordinary things for God on any ordinary day uh, just because we make ourselves available to Him. And so always make yourself available. Say, here I am, Lord. Send me. Use me. You know, God has made each one of us unique. He's made each one of us individuals. And so what He wants to do in and through your life is different than what He does in me and the person next to you. And so just be open to the, the work of the Lord because He is alive. He's living inside of us. He's given us His Holy Spirit. And so there's people all around us that might just need a touch from Jesus that you can provide if you're walking in the Spirit. We also saw last time we need to be quick to give the glory to Jesus Christ because He is the one that works in us and through us to touch other people's lives. That's exactly what Peter did. He sees this crowd after this guy's leaping and jumping, praising the Lord. He says a big crowd comes around Peter and he says, Don't look at us. It wasn't us. It's Jesus. And he tells him, the one you crucified, but he's risen from the dead. He's alive. He's the one that made this man whole. He's the one that saved this guy. And so Peter's message is about Jesus, their need to repent, their need to come to a right relationship with the Lord. So we're going to pick up in chapter 3. We got through verse 21 last time, but let's pick up in verse 17 um, just to get the gist of his message to these people after he told them, you guys denied the Holy One. You denied your Messiah, Jesus, but he's the one that saved this guy. And so in verse 17, it says, Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets, that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. And again, there's about 300 prophecies in the Old Testament dealing with the first coming of Jesus. And he fulfilled all of them perfectly, talking about his atonement. He was the Lamb of God. He's a sacrificial lamb. You know, he's the one that would be you know, crucified, Psalm 22. He'd be raised from the dead, Psalm 16. I mean, it's all there, Isaiah 53. And he says, you know, all these prophecies that Christ would suffer, he has fulfilled. He is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And then he says in verse 19, Repent, therefore, and be converted, be changed, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Again, it's not a popular message, it seems like, in our culture today, in churches, but we're called to repent. You're thinking wrongly, you need to think right. You're thinking this way about Jesus, that he's this, but he's really not that. This is what the Bible says he is. You need to turn from your wrong thinking, turn to what the Bible says about Jesus. And that's what he's calling these Jewish people to do. You wrongly thought he was a false messiah. You wrongly thought, you know, he was here doing these things by the power of Beelzebub. But this is the son of the living God. He's God come in human flesh. And so these are the things the Old Testament prophets shared about. And so you need to turn from you're wrong thinking about him. You need to see he is our Messiah. He is the living Lord and Savior. You need to turn to him. And when you do, he says, you'll be cleansed. You'll be forgiven. Your sins will be blotted out. And then you'll feel the refreshment that comes from the, the, the presence of the Lord. And that is awesome. When you turn from whatever you know has been wrong, you turn to the Lord and you just experience that refreshing that comes from the rivers of living water from Jesus himself, just refreshing your soul, knowing even as a Christian, I've been doing things contrary to the Lord, but now I'm going to turn and do things his way. And there comes that peace that surpasses all understanding. There be this, this indescribable joy that comes upon you. That's what Peter's referring to. Repent, turn to the, the risen Savior, Jesus, and then you will experience this refreshing that comes from the Lord. Verse 20 says, And that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, 
which God has spoken by the mouth of all His holy prophets since the world began. Again, we looked at this last time. It's referring to the second coming of Christ when He, uh, you know, the, the times of restoration, when Jesus returns, sets up His kingdom on earth. It'll be 1,000 years, the millennial reign of Christ, and it's going to be amazing. It's going to be glorious. We'll be in our resurrection bodies, and so He's in heaven He's coming back at his second coming. He's going to establish his kingdom. And all the holy prophets, Peter says, referred to this. And now he's going to quote from one of the Old Testament prophets, Moses. He says in verse 22, For Moses truly said to the fathers, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him, again speaking of Jesus, you shall hear in all things whatever he says to you. Remember, Jesus says, I only say the things the Father tells me to say. I only do what the Father tells me to do. And so Moses says he's going to raise up a prophet like me, and it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet, speaking of Jesus, shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Now here Peter quotes from Deuteronomy 18, and he establishes the fact that Moses prophesied of Jesus Christ and that Jesus is the fulfillment of this prophecy. Jesus and Moses, he says, Moses says he'll be like me. How is he like him? Well, in a few different typologies, we see that um, both of them were nearly killed as babies. Remember when Pharaoh sent out the decree, kill all the Jewish babies when they're born, and then Moses' mother puts them in the basket and sends them down, and then the, the daughter of Pharaoh takes them up, and that's how Moses' life began. Jesus, after he was born, King Herod, when he finds out where, Bethlehem, he sends the guards there to kill all the babies two years old and under. So they both survived you know, that destruction of the, the leadership there. Um, they were both raised by somebody other than their actual father. You know, Joseph was not Jesus' biological dad. He was just the one, he was like the stepdad that raised Jesus. Mary was impregnated by the Holy Spirit. Again, Moses, he was raised at Pharaoh's, in Pharaoh's courtyard. Uh, they both left, you might say, the riches of their home. You know, Jesus coming from glory to earth. You know, Moses raised in Pharaoh's home had everything. I mean, he was very wealthy. And then he ends up fleeing, and he becomes a shepherd for 40 years. Both were rejected the first time they came to their brethren. Moses comes to deliver them. He strikes down the Egyptian. Pharaoh's like, I'm going to kill Moses. So he flees for 40 years. But he's received the second time when God sends him back to be the deliverer. Same with Jesus. He was rejected the first time he came. He will be received. Every Jewish person that goes through the Great Tribulation when they see Jesus, every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and they will mourn for him as a mother mourns for her only son. And every Jew alive after the great tribulation at the second coming of Christ will get saved. They're all going to receive him. And so we see these parallels with Moses and with Jesus. Now, notice in verse 23 again, he says, Every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed. Every one of us, before we come to Christ, we're under condemnation. We're all going to be destroyed. We're all, in a sense, hanging over the lake of fire. That's what we deserve. But Jesus comes to our rescue. He plucks us out from the, you know, hanging over the lake of fire. He saves us. And yet, if you reject Him as your Messiah, you reject Him as your Lord and Savior, you will be utterly destroyed. We all should be, but He takes us from the pit into paradise. I mean, that's how amazing the gospel message is. Look at verse 24. Peter says, Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow, as many as have spoken, have also foretold these days. In other words, Peter is saying, first from Moses. Moses wrote the first five books. So from Genesis, so you got Moses, to Samuel. Samuel's the one that anoints King David. And then it says all these others. So you're basically saying, you know what, folks, from Genesis to Malachi, it all points to Jesus. And that's true. Remember when we went through the book of Exodus, all the things with the tabernacle, everything there, all the sacrifices, everything points to Jesus Christ. And that's what Peter is saying here. 
They've all spoken. They've all foretold these days. It's all pointing us to Jesus Christ. He is the perfect Lamb of God. He is the final sacrifice for sins. Jesus has done it all. You know, He lived a perfect life. He was buried in the grave. He rose on the third day. He ascended up into heaven. He is coming back to establish His kingdom on earth. And we have God's perfect word that tells us these things are going to happen. And so don't doubt the word of God because it's all laid out. Prophecy is one of the great uh, ways we know this is God's word. He foretells all these things in the future, and then it all comes to pass exactly as the Lord says. Now look at verse 25. He says, you are sons of the prophets. Again, he's speaking only to the Jewish people here. It's going to be a few years before the Gentiles will hear the, the gospel message. And so he says, you are sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham. So again, he's going all the way back to Genesis. Genesis 12, 3. And in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. How are all the families of the earth blessed? Through his seed. That's seed in the singular is referring to the Messiah, Jesus. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. So all the families of the earth can be blessed if they will turn to Jesus for salvation. And so that's what He's referring to. The big picture there, it's, it's gonna, Jesus will bless everybody. And then He says in verse 26, To you first... Again, he's speaking to his Jew, Jewish brethren. To you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you. Singular, not the world. He's sending, Jesus came for you. Salvation, Jesus says, is of the Jews. He came unto his own. His own received him not. But as many as received him, to them he gives the right to be called children of God. So to you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. This is what the Apostle Paul refers to in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, where he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes the world. Notice, for the Jew first, and also for the Greeks, the rest of the world. And so he came unto his own. That's what John 1 talks about. He came to his own, and his own received him not. So here, Peter is very clear. He came to you guys. He came to us. We're his brethren. Jesus was born of the tribe of Judah, and he is our Messiah. So he's still speaking. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. Now, as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught to the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. It's only a matter of time before Satan, you know, steps up and says, I'm going to try to stop this before it spreads any further. So he stirs up these religious leaders to come against Peter and John, you know, the church leaders at this time. The Jewish leaders, it says, are greatly disturbed by two things that are mentioned here. First of all, they're greatly disturbed because Peter and John were teaching the people. The priests said, we're the only ones who can teach the people. We're the only ones in the synagogue that have the scrolls. Only we are authorized to teach the people. Nobody had Bibles back then. Nobody had their own set of scrolls at home. The priest's job was to teach the people. Unfortunately, that carried over into the Catholic Church when that started up, you know, 1,500 years ago. And for a long, long time, only the priests could own a Bible. Only the priests in the church could teach the people what the Bible says. They would speak it in Latin, make people even more confused. But nobody could even have a Bible. Many Catholics were put to death if they got a hold of a Bible. Only we can tell you what the truth of God's Word is. No, God's Word is for all of us. But the second reason they're so upset here is because Peter and John preached Jesus and the resurrection from the dead. They were very upset about this, especially the Sadducees. The majority of the religious leaders 
at this time, there are 71 members of the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders. Most of them were Sadducees. Why were they sad, you see? Because they didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in the spiritual realm. And, and so they were very upset. They're preaching about the, the resurrection. And so they were very, very against these guys because they're speaking about the resurrection of Jesus. How can these dumb fishermen know anything about the resurrection? Well, they knew plenty because they hung out with Jesus for three and a half years. They saw him raise people from the dead. They saw Jesus after he rose from the dead. Over 500 people saw Jesus alive, risen from the dead. Now, another reason why the Sadducees especially were so upset is because, remember that first resurrection Sunday morning? What happened? There was an earthquake. The angel rolled the stone away. Jesus rises from the dead. The guards that were put in charge of protecting the tomb, they're freaking out. And so they go running to the Sadducees, and they tell them, there was an earthquake, we saw an angel, the tombstone was rolled away. And it says that they gave these guards a large sum of money to tell people when they ask you what happened, tell them, while you slept, the disciples stole his body. And it says that lie was perpetuated for a long time. And so they're upset because they're talking about the resurrection of the dead. So that's why they're greatly disturbed here. Look at verse 3. And they laid hands on them. And that's not like, okay, come on up. We'll lay hands on you and pray for you. <laughs> they're laying hands on them, like grabbing them, ripping them out of there. I mean, they're, they're mad. They're upset. So they laid hands on them, put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed. And the number of the men came to be about 5,000. This is awesome. One thing the Bible guarantees is that when we, when we live for Jesus, persecution will follow. Jesus says, in this world you'll have tribulation, but take courage, I've overcome the world. It's in 2 Timothy 3.12. It says, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Satan hates the light. And all of his followers love the dark deeds of this world rather than the light of Jesus. Now, when the glorious light of the gospel is preached, people will react in one of two ways. They'll either be broken and humbled, or they'll become more and more arrogant. They'll either receive the good news, or they will reject Jesus. They will either get upset that you are being, you know, labeling them a sinner, or they'll say, you know what, I am a sinner and I need forgiveness. Some will get upset with you when you say, you know what, you need to repent of your sins, turn to Christ. Don't tell me I'm a sinner. I'm no worse than anybody else. Well, we're all worse, you might say. We're all sinners. We all need His salvation. But I love what verse 4 says. Notice it says, Many of those who heard the word believed. They heard the word. What was the word? The gospel. Again, that's the power of God into salvation to everyone who will believe. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. That's why it says they believed. It says 5,000 men. So again, 3,000 get saved on Pentecost. Another 2,000 men get saved here. Remember when Jesus fed the multitudes with the little boy's lunch and he fed 5,000 men, it says? So they're not even including all the wives and the children of these guys. And so many say probably 15,000, 20,000 people were fed by that little guy's lunchable. Here, it's probably fifteen to 20,000 people that have come to Christ with 5,000 men you know, being saved up to this point. So it's an amazing scene. But again, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. It tells us very clearly, many of those who heard the Word believed. Faith comes by hearing, not by seeing signs and wonders. You know, we just went through Exodus, and as you all know, God did miracles every single day in the book of Exodus. You know, not only the ten miracles to bring them out of Egypt with the plagues, but parting the Red Sea, manna from heaven, water from the rock, their sandals didn't wear out. I mean, every day it was a miracle from God, and they get to the promised land. They send in the twelve spies, only Joshua and Caleb come back with a good report. Yeah, there's giants, but we can take it. God's given it to us. The other ten says, no, we're like little grasshoppers. They're going to kill us. 
So they did not enter in because of what? Unbelief. Unbelief. How could they not trust the Lord after everything He did to bring them out of Egypt, to destroy Pharaoh's army, to give them all the manna, everything? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. They believed the Word of God here. They heard the gospel, the power of God unto salvation. Jesus shined the Word of God, and they received. Look at these verses in John 3, 18, right after John 3, 16 and 17. Jesus says, He who believes in Him, in Jesus, is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already. Again, we've all got condemnation over us until you get saved. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. Again, when Jesus is preached, People get divided into two camps, unbelievers, believers, saved and unsaved, light and darkness, humble and arrogant. So make sure you humble yourself when you hear the gospel message, if you're not saved this morning. Look at verse 5. And it came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as, notice these, we've heard these guys before, right, in the gospels, Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, he was also co-high priest at this time, John and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. This is the exact same group about three months earlier who were there condemning Jesus. And they're still in power, they're still in authority, and they now have Peter and John here in their midst, and they're very upset with them. Look at verse 7. And when they had set them in the midst... They asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? So here's Peter and John. They probably felt like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. You know, they were thrown in the fiery furnace. Nebuchadnezzar says, heat it up seven times. They throw him in, and he's surprised because they're not burning up to a little crispy critter. And he looks inside and he goes, I threw three in here. and I see four, and the fourth looks like the Son of God. Jesus was there in their midst. That's why not a hair on their head was singed. And here's Peter and John in the midst of uh, probably a hundred, 71 with the Sanhedrin and all these other guys and families mentioned. There's probably a hundred people there just looking down, sneering at them, upset with them. What are you guys doing? How come you're speaking? You know, what power are you doing this? What name have you done this? This was the fulfillment of what Jesus had taught them Eh, maybe four months earlier, it's in Mark chapter 13, verse 11. It says, Jesus tells his disciples, but when they arrest you and deliver you up, do not worry beforehand or premeditate what you will speak, but whatever is given you in that hour, speak that. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And again, the Holy Spirit will bring the word of God to your remembrance. He'll bring it into your mind, and that's what we're going to see here in a moment. But why are they asking? By what power? What name are you doing this? Because this was their job. They're doing what God told them to do. If somebody comes and they preach a different God, a different way than what we have, then you need to expose them. Find out what they're doing. Who are they? Are they talking about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? They're basically asking, what God do you worship? What power are you doing this? Again, they told Jesus, oh, you're healing people by the power of Beelzebub. They didn't even recognize Jesus is our Messiah. He's the promised one. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. They took up stones to kill him. Why are you going to stone me? For what good works? Not for any good work you do, but because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. They knew exactly what Jesus was saying, and they disagreed with him. And so Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. Well, look at these verses. This is from Deuteronomy 13. And this is why they're asking him, by what name, what power are you doing this? It says in Deuteronomy 13, verse 1, If there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes to pass, so it looks like a legitimate miracle took place here, 
of which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods, which you have not known. Let us serve them. So now a false teacher would say, Hey, let's go this other way. Let's follow this other god, this pagan god, or whatever it might be. You know, Satan does lying signs and wonders. So he says, You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord, Yahweh, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear Him and keep His commandments and obey His voice. You shall serve Him and hold fast to Him. And again, most of Jesus' three and a half year ministry was proving to them, I am your Messiah. I am the one who came from heaven to earth. It's my Father that sent me. You know, and he was trying to prove that over and over again because this is how they looked at him. No, you're a false Messiah. You're talking about a different God. And that's why Jesus would always come back and show them through the word of God exactly who he is. It says in verse 5, That prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death. That's one of the reasons they said, Crucify him, crucify him. Because he has spoken in order to turn you away from the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of bondage and so forth. So that's why they're saying, by what name, what power are you doing this? Again, Jesus is the name. The Holy Spirit is the power. And he's working through the Father. Father, Son, Holy Spirit working together. The three in one, amazing things taking place. So that's why they question him. So then look at verse 8. I love this. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, again, pause there for a moment because this is awesome. Peter and the other 120 were filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Peter spoke in tongues and then he preached the gospel. Here it's referring to Peter being filled again. Remember in uh, Ephesians 5.18, Paul says, don't be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled. It literally means be being filled with the Spirit. We need to continually be filled, refilled. That's just the easy way to put it. If you feel tired and drained, go to the Lord. Say, Lord, I just need to be refilled today. I need rivers of living water flowing in and out of my life. You know, it might be a little drip, drip, drip. I don't want to be a drip. You know, I want rivers to be flowing out of my life. And so he's filled here with the Holy Spirit And this is amazing because here he is standing strong in the power of the Lord, standing up for Jesus, the same Peter who about three months earlier, little girl said, you're with him. You're one of those guys from Galilee. I don't know the man, he said. And he starts cursing and he's so upset and he's, I don't know. The third time, the rooster crows, he denied the Lord and he runs and flees. So here he is three months later. Now he's filled with the Holy Spirit, standing in front of a hundred guys that want to kill him. They're upset with him, and he's standing in the power of the Lord, working in him and through him. This is the difference between walking in the Spirit and walking in the flesh. In the power of the Holy Spirit, he's able to preach the Word. He's no longer worried about his own reputation. And that's really a key. When you're sharing with people, get your eyes off yourself. I mean, I've had that issue most of my life. Oh, I'm thinking, oh, how are they looking at me? How are they perceiving me? Get your eyes off yourself. It's all about Jesus. When you're walking in the Spirit, it's going to be all about Jesus, not yourself. The only thing that matters is that the Lord is glorified. So listen to what he says. Very powerful, short little message. A lot shorter than my message this morning. Then Peter, Philip, the Holy Spirit said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel. I mean, here's the boldness of Peter as he's standing before before all these people that hate him. If we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, that phrase made well, the Greek is sozo, means he's been physically healed and spiritually saved. The full package. This guy is a new creation in Christ. So if we're judged for how this happened, let it be known to you, verse 10, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, so he's not being politically correct here, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here 
before you whole. Now, this is pretty amazing. Now, here's this guy that was healed. 40 years, he's been lame. Now he's standing with Peter and John. I mean, he could have just fled. He could have, I'm healed, I'm out of here. They had just arrested Peter and John. I'm out of here. No, he's standing there with them. So Peter's like, this guy, you're talking to me. Here's proof. God did it. Jesus healed this man. But this is awesome because he's not beating around the bush here. He, he looks around. He sees all these self-righteous religious leaders, all these influential men of authority, men who are judging him and John because of this helpless lame man who's now healed. And Peter says, I'll tell you and I'll tell all of Israel. This man is healed by the risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God did it. And so he's deflecting all the attention away from him. It's the Lord. You have an issue with this, guys? Take it up with Jesus. You know, the true preaching of the cross always deals with the sin of man. The true gospel message always deals with sin first, and then, you know, his crucifixion for sin, and then his resurrection. There's no good news unless you tell people the bad news first. A lot of people think, oh, I'm basically a good person, so why do I need good news? Good news is I'm a good person. No, the bad news is you're a sinner hanging over the flames of eternity into, over the lake of fire. The good news is Jesus wants to save you and spare you from utter destruction. So here, again, this includes all of us. We're all guilty before the Lord. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. But the true gospel message always deals with sin first. Look at these verses in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. Paul describes the one true gospel message that saves by saying, For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Again, many, many Scriptures in the Old Testament. There has to be a penalty paid for our sins. Atonement must be made. Jesus is the Lamb of God. He was sacrificed in our place. He shed His blood for our sins. That's first and foremost. That Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That's the simple gospel message. Here Peter spoke the truth. You guys crucified Jesus. You're the ones that had all the people yell out, crucify him, crucify him. Pontius Pilate was ready to let him go. But you guys insisted on having him put to death. So just as quick as he points the finger at them, because they are guilty, he reminds them, God raised him from the dead. And you guys could get saved too, if you'll humble yourselves. The only two we know of, of the Sanhedrin that got saved, was Joseph of Arimathea and Nick at night, Nicodemus. You know, those two, we think, we, I'm sure they're the ones that took his body off the cross that came to the Lord. The other ones, I'm not so sure of. So, in about, whatever, 20 seconds, Peter answers their question, what power is this? The power of God. What name are we doing this? In the name of Jesus. That's the source. He's the one working these things for his glory. Let me give you a, um, a little advice when it comes to witnessing to people. We need to get to know them a little bit before we just blast them with some message. It's not about having a canned response, because everybody's different. Everybody you run into is different. This is the third message, this is the third gospel time and presentation that Peter gives. And all three, the core is death of Christ, resurrection of Christ on Pentecost with the guy after he was healed, and now in front of the Sanhedrin. But everyone has a little difference to them because it's not a canned sermon. He's harsh with these guys. That's what they needed. When you get to Acts chapter 10, and he first gives the gospel to Cornelius, the first Gentiles, it's a whole different way of approaching the gospel. It's all there. He died, he buried, he rose again, but he's not harsh with them at all. Because they didn't know their Messiah. They didn't know Jesus. He wasn't their Messiah. He was a Jewish Messiah. And so he approaches it differently. All I say is, when you talk to people, get to know them. See where they're coming from. I mean, everybody's got a different background. And, and yet you get the core message there. Yes, he loves you. He died for you. He, he 
rose from the grave. That's how we know he loves you is because he died in your place. Here's how Jude says it, Jude verses 22 and 23. He says, on some have compassion, making a distinction. So most people don't need a bullhorn in the window of their car. Repent, you sinner, you're going to burn in hell. That happened to me when I was a Christian down on North Avenue here. And it's like, that's a bad approach. And that didn't draw me closer. I was already saved. It didn't draw me close to the Lord. I mean, if you're doing that to unbelievers, repent, you're a sinner, you're going to burn in hell with a bullhorn right there. It's not going to convince anybody of the love of Jesus. You know, so on some have compassion. People know I've been beat up. I messed up. I've sinned. I've done all these bad things. You want to tell me that God loves me? You want me to, you want me to believe that Jesus died for my sins? He was nailed to the cross for me? I mean, they need to hear the love, the compassion, the forgiveness of God. And then he says here, and some have compassion, making this thing. Others save with fear, like these Pharisees. They thought, oh, we're good with God. We got the Old Testament scriptures down. Jesus says, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, but these are they which testify of me. The whole Bible is about Jesus. If you don't see Jesus, you need to wake him up. You need to realize you're going to be, you know, lost for eternity. You're hanging over the judgment of God. And so like Peter, know your audience, let the Holy Spirit lead you and guide you as you speak the truth in love. Again, to those who hear, need to hear the good news of Jesus. And that's really the bottom line. People need to see Jesus. People need to hear from our mouths the love of Christ. They need to see from our lives the love of Christ. They need to see the awesome things He's done in our lives. And so we all have a testimony of His goodness and grace. Now again, notice... We'll see later next time, you know, they looked at Peter and John as these untrained, unlearned idiots, these fishermen from Galilee. And so notice what he says here in verse 11. Peter says, This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Here Peter is quoting from Psalm 118, verse 22. I mean, he's been going through so many scriptures. Again, on the day of Pentecost, he's quoting from Joel. He's quoting from the Psalms. Here he's quoting from Psalm 118. He's quoted from Moses, from, you know, uh, the book of Deuteronomy. I mean, he may have been unlearned, untrained fisherman from Galilee, but one thing he knew was the Word of God. If I don't know anything else, and I don't know much about anything in this world, I want to know God's Word. I want to know Jesus, the one who loved me, the one who died for me. And so here, Peter quotes from Psalm 118, as the Holy Spirit is bringing this to his remembrance, bringing this verse into his mind, a verse that speaks of the rejection of Jesus Christ by the religious leaders of Israel. But again, once rejected, here it says Jesus becomes the chief cornerstone. Now, many believe it's a reference to when they when Solomon built the temple, you would start with the cornerstone. That was the foundation stone. Everything was built off of that, measured off of that. If that stone wasn't right, then everything else would be off. Jesus is the one we measure everything off of. He's the one we build upon. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul says, the foundation is Jesus. Make sure you take heed how you build on that foundation. He is the rock. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 14, we're told that the Lord himself is both a sanctuary to those who are stumbling, um, or, or he's a sanctuary to those of us who believe, sorry, but he is a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to those who do not believe. Jesus is the, the rock. We already talked about that in the wilderness. Moses, strike the rock and out will come water. Paul says that rock in the wilderness was Christ. He's the foundation. Jesus talks about you can build your house on the sand. When the storms of life hit, it's all going to crumble because you're not building on the right foundation. Build your house on the rock, that's Jesus. And when the storms of life hit you, the difficulties come into your life, you're going to stand because you're standing on Jesus who will never leave you nor forsake you. And so here Peter saying, you rejected the chief cornerstone. He is the one that the you know, Bible prophesied about. In Matthew 21, 44, 
It says, Jesus says, and whoever falls on this stone will be broken. In other words, if you humble yourself and you fall upon Jesus in your brokenness, knowing I can't save myself, I'm a sinner, I'm helpless and hopeless to make it on my own, you fall upon the rock Jesus, and then he will restore you. He'll heal the brokenhearted. But Jesus goes on to say, but on whomever the stone falls, it will grind him to powder, which speaks of the day when the unrepentant sinner will stand before God and they will receive what they are due because they did not want Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So here Peter declares to these religious leaders, you builders of the Jewish faith, you have rejected the chief cornerstone. Now, as if to drive the stake even deeper into their hearts, here's how he finishes his sermon, and this is where we'll stop. Look at verse 12. Peter says, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Again, the word there is sozo, spiritually saved, physically healed, if that's what you need, but most importantly, physically or spiritually saved. Peter's very clear. How many roads lead to everlasting life? One. How many roads lead to paradise in the presence of God? One. How many sacrifices does God desire and require for atonement of sin? One. Jesus Christ. The only way of salvation. You know, I've talked to people in the past, and I'm sure many of you have as well, and they'll have an attitude, oh, you know, all roads lead to heaven. doesn't matter what road you choose. doesn't matter what path you're on. If you just believe in something, you're going to make it into heaven. There's only one road, Jesus. John 14, 6, he says to him, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. That's why he says it's a narrow road. It's a narrow path. It's Jesus. Jesus is the one who said, broad is the path that leads to eternal destruction. Many are on that path. That's why we use the gospel to tell people on that wide path, Jesus loves you, he died for you, receive him, he'll save you, and then they can come onto that narrow path as well. But without Jesus, they're lost for eternity. He's not one way to God. He's the only way to God. I've I've unfortunately had to tell people, you know what? Only one way to heaven, but all roads do lead to the great white throne, which is sentencing day for those who rejected Jesus as their Lord and Savior. But isn't it wonderful how God has taken the guesswork out of going to heaven? Jesus made it so simple. Put your faith and trust in me alone and you will be saved. That's what the Philippian jailer asked Paul and Silas, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Believe in Jesus. Believe in him. You'll be saved. And if your household believes, they'll be saved as well. We have an amazing relationship with God. And it doesn't matter what kind of a dysfunctional family you may have come out of, whether it was an abusive home, whether it was an alcoholic home, that's what I came out of, whether it was a neglected home, whether it was a home that had a single parent or maybe even no parents. When we come into that new glorious relationship with Christ and with God the Father, He becomes the father to the fatherless. He becomes the husband to the widow or the single mom. He becomes our brother. He becomes our best friend. He knows all of our needs, and he is able to meet all of our needs because he alone is Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus is all that we need. The Bible says he's our wonderful counselor, our everlasting father. He's the prince of peace. He's our chief shepherd. He's our comforter. He's our physician. He's our defender. So don't resist Him. Receive Him. If you don't know Him today, receive Him as your Lord and Savior because He loves you, plain and simple. He didn't create you to throw you into the lake of fire. He created you because He loves you and He wants you to come into this amazing relationship with the Creator of the universe.
sounds too good to be true. I thought it was too good to be true. I mean, I knew when my eyes were opened up to see what a wretched sinner I was. It's like, God, how could you love me? Why would you love me? Because he loves us. Not because of anything we've done or haven't done. He just loves us. But he doesn't want to leave you in your lost condition. He wants you to humble yourself and come to him by faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I don't know if there's anybody in here that doesn't know you as their Lord, Messiah, Savior. But if they don't, I pray, Lord, they would just open up their heart to you. I pray that their eyes would be opened up to see how much you love them. Lord, you created all of us with a free will. And I pray that they would see their need for Jesus. They would recognize that he went to the cross. He died in their place. He shed his blood for their sins. And it's only because he rose from the grave, he conquered death, that he's alive. He's here right now in our midst. And he might be knocking on the door of your heart. And if you'll open up that door, he will come into your life. He will save you. And he'll wash you clean. But you need to repent so that you can experience the refreshing that comes from the presence of the Lord. Father, we thank you for the boldness of the Apostle Peter and John and even the, the new believers standing with them. We thank you for their example. But in the power of the Holy Spirit, we can stand against an army of those who hate us, those who doubt you. But Lord, we can be bold in our witness as we walk in the power of your Holy Spirit rather than in the weakness of our flesh. And so I pray, Father, that each one of us here would receive the refilling of the Spirit this morning, that you would cleanse our hearts, renew our minds, Strengthen us, Lord, so that we can walk in your power and not in our weakness. Only then people see how awesome you are. Only then can people taste and see that the Lord is good. And so, Father, use us as vessels of honor for your glory. And may we always give you the glory for the great things you've done in our lives. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.